Hey, everyone. Before we get to today's episode of Perpetual Chess, I just wanted to say thanks to everyone who has supported the show. Ways to support Perpetual Chess include telling a friend about the show, subscribing on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you use, better yet, leaving a positive review on that platform. But most of all, I want to thank the people who've supported me with the new Patreon page. If you haven't heard, it's patreon.com slash perpetual chess. And the suggested donation there is $2 a month. So I tried to keep it as affordable as possible for as many people as possible. The donations go to cover things like the production, the audio equipment, and the hosting for the show. So if you can't afford it, you definitely shouldn't donate. But if you can, it's really appreciated and it helps out a lot. And guess what? I think it's also going to make the show better. What we're going to do is people who donate to the show will get advance notice of the guests and they will have the chance to send in questions to the guests. So if you feel like there's some topic I don't cover enough, or if you have some favorite player that you're waiting for them to come on, well, there's a good chance we're going to get them at some point. So now you can sit back and wait. And then when someone's coming on who interests you, you can pounce like a cheetah and get your questions in. I think this is going to make it a better show overall, more community driven. I've always said I want this show to be by the people and for the people. Well, I think that this will help make that happen. So thanks again for all the support and enjoy today's episode. Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Perpetual Chess. I am here with chess player, coach, journalist, commentator, Grandmaster Christian Kirilla. Christian, how did I do with your name? Uh, that was uh, almost perfect. Though. Oh, wow. All right. Glad to hear that we're off to a good start. So, Christian, as we as we record this, I know that you you live in California, but um, you're you're joining us from St. Louis as the GM in residence. So, could you tell our listeners a little, a little bit about what that's like? Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I live in California for uh, the past three years, but to be honest, uh, this uh, this past year, 2017, uh, has been just uh, hectic. Most of the times, I'm not in 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 Cali. Maybe I've been there for like. Two months the whole year um, a lot of time in st louis i did uh, go back to my family in romania uh, but yeah right now i'm in st louis i'm uh, the grandmaster in residence and uh it's it's a lot of fun we're having a lot of uh, lectures um some free time as well so you can focus on your own uh endeavors i uh i'm training currently for a tournament that uh, that's that's going to be uh taking place in uh at the end of the month at the end of november um, in St. Louis. So um, I, I like it. You know, they treat us well here. Excellent. So is this one of those uh, invitational tournaments? Yeah, it's a, I think it's a norm event. So we there is an IM section and there's a GM section and I'm playing in the GM uh, section alongside uh, two other grandmasters and a lot of hungry IMs. Nice. So let's hear it. I'm sure there's some familiar names to our listeners. So who else is playing that you know of? Well, I know the whole list. I, I can check it out for you. But I know uh, my good friend Aman Hamilton is going to look for a norm. Okay. Uh, he's uh, coming all the way from Canada. And then as the Grandmasters, we have uh, Julio Sodora, former UT Dallas student. Uh, I went to UTD as well. So uh, we know each other from there. And then I think uh, there is a Webster Grandmaster. Um, not sure. Not sure about his name, but... That's uh that, that's about the Grand Masters okay. and then uh, the International Masters I think uh, yeah Man Hamilton Gurevich I think uh, Atulia Shetty from uh, Chicago and uh, some other names that I cannot remember right now. Okay, so so among other things, you've got a few friends playing in that event. What's that like to like have to prepare for and like uh, eventually compete against your friends? I, I mean you know during the game uh, we forget about the friendship, but. Uh, we, we are actually training together so um, for that particular event. So That's funny. A, I was going to make a joke that you guys couldn't prep together, but I guess we, you we can. are. Yeah, yeah, we are. We are. There's, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's only one game. There's uh, other uh, 
eight players that we're both going to face. So, right. uh, you know, it makes some sense to do some preparation together. Okay. Yeah. And I know that you've, uh, you've worked with Amon and Eric Hansen and some of the other chess bras in the past. So it mm-hmm. must be a nice familiar feeling. Mm-hmm. 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 Yes. Yes. So, so what's uh, the, so in terms of your training with the tournament a few weeks out, uh, how much of it is um, geared towards your individual opponents and how much of it is just sort of like brushing up on your overall theory? Uh, I'd say it's uh, it's it's general for me. Um, I don't I don't necessarily start training specifically for an opponent uh, up until up until the last moment. I generally try to uh, uh, brush up on my uh, on my theory, of course. But uh, I, I tend to diversify. I get very bored, very uh, very easily bored. So um, I cannot do just theory. I would uh, I, I, I would burn out very quickly. So what I do, I uh, I, I try to. Uh, keep my imaginative side uh, running. So I do tactics, I do studies. Um, I play games against uh, some of my training partners, uh, you know, rapid games where intuition plays, uh, plays a, big, a big role. And, uh, and then we analyze our games and we see what we did right, what we did wrong. That way we cover a lot of topics, uh, including opening theory as well as middle game and end game. Um, analysis as well. So I think I'm trying more or less to uh, keep a com- complete training schedule. Okay. Now, um, with these training games, do you ever have trouble taking them seriously if they're not like a rated game? No, no, no. Um, I mean, we're all competitive uh, individuals. We're competitive chess players. Um, and um, that's actually part of the training, you know, because sometimes you if you don't train for an event, the first few rounds can, can be rough. Um, you, you have trouble concentrating, you have trouble uh, finding your motivation, uh, as you were mentioning. So I think, uh, that's exactly what helps, um, for, for, for the tournament when we play, uh, against each other, you know, the competitive side, uh, the analysis side and so on. So no, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to take everything, uh, Quite seriously. When, okay. When and I any? Uh, oh, sorry to cut you off there. No, no, no problem. Um, any gambling on these matches, or just just pride? <laughs> like, do you get some good trash talking if you do a training game against Saman and you come out on top? How does it work? Uh, we, I mean, we trash talk a little bit maybe after the game, but um, you know, generally it's just a learning process. But of course, there's always uh, there's always that will to win. You right, know. of course. Yeah, you don't get to where you are without being a bit a bit competitive. Of course, of yeah. course. No, chess players are uh, extremely competitive individuals, and and that's perfectly fine. I think you have to embrace that. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, we'll get back to your playing, Christian, because mm-hmm. uh, I'm, you know, obviously it's a topic of much interest. But I, I did want to talk a little bit more about what it's like being the GM in residence. We've had we've had a few people who've who've done that job, and of course, uh, GM Feingold, who did it for a long time. But uh, I'm just curious, like. So you mentioned you do a decent amount of lectures, and then my understanding is you also sort of have like office hours where you just help people who come in. Is that right? Uh, correct. Uh, office hours um, meaning that okay, I will be at the club. If uh, if people do have questions for me, then I will gladly answer them. Um, and uh, also, people can book lessons with me. Okay. During those office hours. And for um, the people who book lessons, if they're a member of the club, that's just part of what you do as the GM in residence, right? Correct. Yes. Yes. Um, financially, I don't get paid. They, you know, but I'm, I, I'm on, I'm on a schedule and they just send me students. Uh, if somebody books me, that's a great deal for the students. Uh, I'm not sure students do pay. <laughs> oh, they just do don't pay. pay you. Yes. They don't pay me directly. Okay. Uh, but what about like, cause I know they, I mean, I should have, I'm sure I touched on this when I talked to Rex Sinkfeld a bit, but like if you're an annual member, do you pay on top of that? I don't, uh, you might not know, actually. That, that I don't know. That yeah. I don't know. I, I, I'm not so sure about it. I, I mean, these are... Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll get to the bottom of that. I'm sure, um, yes. I'm sure someone out there can set me straight on that. But So anyway, like you, you basically, you help people with their repertoire, and if they have a game to bring in, they can bring it in and stuff like that to review. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, generally we don't get a lot of lessons together, so I always ask uh, ask them what they want to work on. Uh, most of them just want to practice uh, playing a game and then analyzing it. Um, so we do that. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, depending 
I, I try to mold my training on, 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 on the requirements of my student. Okay. And um, do you have a favorite, like, uh, out of your roles there, do you have a favorite thing, like giving lectures versus one-on-one time? Uh, I, I would say I, I really enjoy giving lectures. I know most of the most of the guys around in the audience, uh, so we, we we get to crack some jokes and uh, we get some good good analysis. Uh, my most favorite lecture is uh, the ones the one that they just introduced. I think uh, I didn't have to teach it last year. It's called the Puzzlers Paradise. So basically, you just uh, come up with well, you prepare. I prepare. Uh, some very interesting puzzles, and then we try to decipher them uh, during the lecture. But uh, there's a lot of communication during that lecture, so I really enjoy that one. Nice. So where do you get the material for something like that? Uh, I have a da- database with uh, maybe 100,000 studies. Wow. <laughs> so, so what I do, I just uh, go through it. You know, I pick the one, some of them that I think uh, are quite interesting. And then I just present. Unbelievable. Present. So where do you get that database? Is it just like from your years of study or was it hand- <laughs> given to you? No, Top no, secret was, information? Uh-oh. <laughs> that was given uh, given to me um, when I first, well, when I first started taking teaching seriously, um, right before I graduated in like 2013, uh, maybe a year before I graduated, um, I was already kind of anticipating that I'm going to go that route and, and, and just uh, become a teacher, among other things. And um, I had a mentor in Dallas. Uh, his name is Babakuli Anakov, who, uh, who gave me a lot of material. Uh, he taught me a lot about, you know, the business side of, uh, of, of being an instructor. And, uh, yeah, he, he's, he's the one that gave me this huge, huge database with studies. Cool. That so, I sometimes use for myself. So, like, what did he, uh, what's some advice he imparted to you about the business side? What was particularly helpful that you learned from him? <laughs> well, maybe the the most important thing uh, that uh, that he he told me is that students just come and go. Oh, yeah, yeah, students just come and go. So don't take it personally. Um, I've had I, I've had many students just. Uh, come take some lessons and then just lose interest because maybe they weren't on par uh, with the requirements I was, uh, I was asking of them, you know, and, um, and, and they just go, you, you cannot take it personally. So I think that's extremely important. Otherwise, psychologically might be tough when, when somebody abandons you, you know? Yeah. I've been on, I've been on both sides of that. Um, yeah. So Christian, you mentioned, uh, you have requirements for your students that sometimes sort of drives them away. What are, what are these requirements? Um, I, I, I tend to, uh, to have a high bar for my students. I, right now, I only take uh, you know, professional, professional, or up-and-coming talents. Um, I, I had, when I first started, I had you know, a thousands, and like, uh, um, I had... Uh, a school teacher that just simply wanted to refresh her brain every Sunday morning. And uh, that kind of burned me out. I had students that, uh, for example, were one, one of them took classes for uh, two years and uh, she never played a single tournament game. Wow. So <laughs> it was a little bit frustrating. And at some point you just have to say, okay, um, I, I cannot do this. I, I do want to, my, my game was, was becoming worse and worse. Um, when I was uh, when I was teaching, well, let's say, not motivated, not motivated enough students. Uh, so right now, you know, this is what I look at whenever I accept uh, a new student, whether he, you know, he has actual goals, palpable goals, and he wants to he wants to improve, even if. You know, he's only rated 1800, but maybe he, he's a youngster and he tells me that, okay, by next year I want to be 2000 or 2100. I know what I'm working towards. And um, then obviously I'm going to ask him to do certain things on his own. I don't think a coach, a coach is just uh, somebody that um, guides you, in my opinion that points you in the right direction, the, the, the heavy workload, you have to put it um, on, on your own time. And a lot of people don't understand that. 
So that's what I'm trying to emphasize whenever I get a new student. Yeah, that's the fact that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've had a similar experience. I mean, I'm you know not not a player on your level, but nonetheless, like yeah, you you can only help people so much. If, uh, um. Right, and I think everybody has their own styles. Um, they have their own training styles as well, training routines. Uh, they enjoy working on certain topics more more than the others. So by 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 finding what those training routines are uh, through experiment, that's the only way uh, they will get better and they will actually enjoy uh, working on chess and not burn out really quickly because it's very quickly to burn out on chess. Um, I I say that from my own experience. Uh, it 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 took me a while until I could find uh, something that I actually enjoyed doing for a long time. You know? In terms of how you studied? In, in terms of how I studied. And yeah. what was it? How did, what did you uh, end up doing? Uh, well, what I'm doing right now is just I, 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 I diversify. Uh, I, I tend to start with, uh, with tactics. Uh, then if I have a training partner, I'm going to go and play a few games, then analyze those games. And then... Uh, Recently, I've 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 studied uh, some of uh, Jacob Augard's books. Mm-hmm. Um, he has a lot of interesting positions, um, and uh, that's about it. I, I don't like working on opening theory that much, even though uh, the perception might be from from people that have told me that I have good openings. Nevertheless, I I uh, I don't tend to agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, your your upcoming opponents can take note of that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you know, it's it, it's something that, of course, uh, of course, I have to work on, and um, you know, I, I I don't like going to a tournament without being prepared. So, um, it, it, generally, psychologically, if if I go unprepared, I will play very badly. <laughs> it it happens all the time. I yeah. rarely go to a tournament uh, without practice ahead and actually have a good one. That makes sense. Well, it sounds like you'll be properly geared up for this one coming up. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm trying to. You never know, but I, I'm yeah. just going to try. <laughs> so what are you – like you're sort of – we've had a few guests like this. Obviously, uh, you know, you're an amazing chess player. To make Grandmaster is a fantastic achievement, but uh, – from my perspective, thinking of it as as you, I I'm not sure what my next goal would be. Like, do you do you have a, a current? You mentioned you like goals for your stu- your students mm-hmm. have clear goals. Do you have a clear goal right now with your playing? Absolutely, uh, twenty six hundred. Nice. It's, been, it's it's been my goal for for a long time. Um, I was I was kind of distracted. You know, I'm still I haven't played this year too much chess. I played only maybe four tournaments. Uh, all together, but my results have been encouraging. Um, I'm I, I'm training much more than I used to train. So from from my own playing experience, from, from my own playing perspective, then yes, it's uh, the goal is 2600. But there's uh, you know there's so many other things uh, on the side uh, that I have to take care of that you know sometimes that has to be sidetracked. But okay. whenever I play, uh, I play with that goal in mind. Okay, and what's your rating right now? It's uh, around 2560, uh, 2557, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. But it's, <laughs> you know, I, I, I was 17 when I was 25, 27, and then eight years later, uh, I was, at the beginning of this year, I was 2515, maybe, or 2510, something like that. So um, <laughs> I haven't been improving that much in the past many, many years. Do you feel like, I mean, you must feel like you know more about chess than you did when you were 17, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's definitely much more knowledge there. Um, and, and, and I think much more practical knowledge as well. So that's why I'm expecting and I'm hoping for for you know for a jump all the way to 2600. Okay. Nevertheless, you know there's so many good players at that level. There's so many good players that only do chess uh, at the 2600 threshold. You know it's it's a lot of training. It's a lot of psychological barriers that you have to overcome. So we'll see. Uh, that's that's definitely the goal, but we'll see where it goes. So what would be an example of a psychological barrier, Christian? 
Well, for the past eight years, <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> I've stayed uh, between twenty five hundred and twenty five fifty at the most. Uh -huh. um, but uh, yeah, I did. I, I this is the first time I'm crossing twenty five fifty actually. Oh, nice. I, I, okay. I had twenty five forty nine, and uh, that actually helped because I <laughs> I was playing millionaire uh, two years ago, and. Uh, I think Caden Trough almost qualified as well, but he didn't qualify in the final four because uh, he had 25.51, I think, or something, 25.53, like a year and a half ago. And the rule was that you can only have it uh, after two years ago. Okay. So one, one and a half years ago wasn't qualifying. Uh, and I never passed 25.50, so I was safe. Huh, funny. <laughs> that, helped, that helped me a little bit. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of a strange rule. So you're referring to the Millionaire Open, uh, Maurice Millionaire Ashley's Open. currently mm -hmm. dormant uh, tournament. And you, mm -hmm. uh, you ended up winning a nice little prize there, right? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I won on my third year. I participated in all three of them, but uh, only in the third one. When the prices were like, I don't know, 40, 50 percent uh, smaller, I managed to qualify. And win <laughs> of course, <it>. right. <laughs> but still, it was a, uh, it, it was, it was one of my favorite tournaments in general. I really enjoyed playing that one. Um, the organization was really good. Um, I'm, I'm good buddies with Maurice, so you know, it's, nice. uh, it's good. Yeah, and uh, okay, so Christian and. and First of all, I should say, for listeners curious to read more about that, Christian did a nice little write-up for, uh, what, was it U.S. Chess Online that you wrote that? Uh, which one? Ah, the Millionaire about, Chess Articles. Yeah, or was that on your blog? Uh, I can't remember. U.S. Chess. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. US I've chess. been reading a lot of your writing the past week, so it kind of all, it was, it's very good, but it blends together a little bit. Um, thank you, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. No, it's fun. <laughs> like, one good thing about having this podcast is like, uh, you know, when I get to read stuff like that you've written and I watched like one of your YouTube lectures, it's like it's under the umbrella of preparation for the podcast, but I find it interesting and it helps my chest anyway. So it's it's uh, kind of like a win win for me. That, that's that's good to hear. Absolutely. Nice. Yeah. All right, so Christian, with your training games, just like one or two other questions, I'm just curious because we've had different, I mean, every guest says, okay, like one of the main ways to get better at chess is to go over your games. But mm -hmm. I think people have different opinions about like uh, the degree of um, agony you should subject yourself to when you go over your games. So like you play a training game with Amon Hamilton and you guys are mm -hmm. done, like what's next? What's the very next step? Uh, we, we look, we go over the game immediately together immediately. Yeah. Yeah. We just, uh, I mean, we use Skype, you right. know, uh, and then we just, uh, go through the game, uh, together and we focus mostly on, on the opening if necessary. And, and, you know, then after that we discuss certain ideas that, uh, we had during the game. These are, keep in mind, these are not long games. These are 15 plus two games. Okay. Um, 15 minutes plus two seconds uh, increment. Uh, pro chess league time control. Good, yeah. Uh, so in, in the same time, we're also kind of training for for the pro chess league. Uh, that's another tournament that we're keeping our eyes on. Right. Uh, but well, are, yeah. so are you playing this year? Yeah, I'm going to uh, to to play for uh, my team, the San Jose Hackers. Oh, nice. They they were so, strong last year. Were you on the, Were you on the team last year? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was I was on the team last For, year. Forgive um, forgive my ignorance. No, 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 no. I did, I I mean, you know, I we were all the time rotating. I don't think I I, I played actually every match, but uh, maybe in some matches I was playing only two games. It was a tough uh, it was a tough event. We started off uh, fairly shy, you know. We won the first game, but after that I think we lost two in a row. And um after that, we managed to qualify. You know, in the end, uh, I think we beat the Las Vegas Desert Rats, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. That sounds right. Yeah, towards uh, towards the end to, uh, to 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 qualify, and uh, we had a good run in the playoff. We beat uh, Dallas, but uh, which was a very strong team. Uh, Jeffrey Shong was uh, leading them. Then they had the Conrad Holt, Rui Feng Lee, a lot of uh, a lot of very young up and coming grandmasters. Um, and after that, we, we lost against Webster, uh, a tough, a tough match. We actually beat Webster in the regular season. The first match we played, we beat them quite, uh, quite convincingly. I think it was, uh, 
Actually, I, I don't remember the, the, the score, but it was quite convincingly. And then they beat us pretty badly in, in the playoff. Um, they managed to find their stride, I guess, throughout the throughout the regular se- season uh, because they have so many players. Right. Uh, so, so they have a rotation going on. And uh, yeah, they just completely killed us. Yeah. Uh, but overall, it was just it, it was just a fun event. Yeah, for sure. And do you guys have uh, Mamadiarov lined up again this year? Mm-hmm. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. That's your big gun. Any uh, any new recruits? Mm-hmm. Bringing the band back together. <laughs> <laughs> even if we even if we do have any new recruits, uh, I cannot tell them to you. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. I cannot tell them to you yet. You can no, tell me, actually, but you'd have to kill me, right? <laughs> right. Actually, I, I, I'm uh, I'm not sure. I think we lost Daniel Oroditsky. Um, to the mechanics, which was a pity. Well, they have oh. to get in, though, right? Uh, I mean, I don't think they're in. Yeah, yeah. As we're recording this, this is going to be another of those classic as we're recording this things because uh, news news changes fast. But uh, as of today, they have an open vote for the um, additional spot. They didn't qualify on Correct. Saturday, but it's like them against Minnesota. And one other team to get voted I think in. New York, something. But Minnesota something. looked to be running away with the vote due to that YouTube powerhouse John Bartholomew. So, um, right. Yeah. So I think uh, I don't know what happens. Like if uh, um, Daniel Nero, Nero do, sorry, I'm gonna butcher Narodinsky. butcher Narodinsky. his name. My my apologies, <laughs> Mr. Grandmaster. Um, but <laughs> so I don't know if he can come back to your team once they don't have a team or how all that works. But I maybe guess. yes. No, I think uh, I think that's definitely uh, legal. Okay. Uh, from uh, from the Proches League regulation yeah. perspective, but uh, yeah, we have some uh, some some names in mind. We'll we'll see if we can get everybody. But I think uh, overall we have a quite uh, quite a solid team. Uh, last year we were struggling a little bit um, on our lower boards. Um, but I think uh, I think this year we will be able to put up a better fight and maybe nice maybe maybe win it. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited for it. And uh, I wanted to talk about like the places you've lived anyway. Um, uh, we'll get to the Bay Area, but first, um, you know, one of the goals of this podcast is to to get the perspective of many different places. And of course, uh, your being from Romania is a, a unique. Um, unique place to grow up as far as our listeners are concerned. So how Mm -hmm. could you tell a little bit about your background and what chess was like there? Um, Absolutely. Well, I started chess when I was uh, really young. My dad taught me uh, at five years of age. He basically, uh, we agreed uh, on on, on a pact. Uh, He he told me he's going to withdraw me from uh, the last year of kindergarten, which I hated. I hated kindergarten. Uh, if uh, I would learn chess, if I would be willing to learn chess from him. So we started off, uh, you know, playing chess, learning chess. Then we started off going to uh, to clubs uh, in, in the Bucharest area. And uh, I just loved it, I guess, because I was beating everybody. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I, I got pretty decent pretty fast. Um, and, and, and after that, um, chess was kind of my second family. I was uh, traveling a lot. Uh, I I didn't go as much uh, to school. That's one of the big differences uh, between Europe and 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 the United States. Um, nowadays, I, I see a lot of kids with with great chess potential just uh, being homeschooled. Um, but uh, I I, th- I think a lot of them just go the academic route, and um, they're not as willing to allow them to 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 just like miss school. Um, so that's a big problem. In Romania, I, 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 I had this luxury. Uh, I was allowed by, you know, the principal and, uh, and, and all the teachers to miss a lot of school, go to tournaments, uh, participate, and just take my exams whenever I would be back. So I, I think I was going to school maybe two, three months, four months at the most per year, um, which was helpful in that regard. Yeah, sounds good um, to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean... That I guess that's why I also consider uh, uh, I also consider chess my my second family because I, I spent so much time with them uh, back in Romania. So yeah, that's uh, what I was doing. I was uh, playing a lot of tournaments. I, I I don't think I missed a European or World Championship Youth Championship since I was ten years of age. Um, and uh, and in two thousand nine. 
I think, or 2010, the UT Dallas offered me a scholarship. So I took it. And uh, that's how my uh, American journey began. Okay, so we'll get to uh, the... Um We'll get to the United States, but uh, so in terms of when you were a kid, did you have anyone helping you with your training? Absolutely, I had uh, I had coaches uh, all throughout my my chess career, I guess, uh, all throughout the moment when I when I left uh, to to the U.S. Actually, um, my dad was my first coach, and uh, and and after that, uh, I worked with uh, Mihail Ginda. Which is uh, one of the, one of the better coaches in Romania, um, as well as as others um, low rated players that you probably or the audience probably will not know their names. Okay. Um, and were you but, getting? Uh, uh, you were basically one of the the top youths in Romania, being that you're yes. playing. You've won many titles, and you were playing in sort of the world youth. Just yes. to, just to be clear to the audience. So, out of curiosity, were you getting support uh, from like the Romanian Federation or government, or was it all funded by your family? Uh, not. I, I mean, there was there was some funding coming from my family. Uh, of course, the federation was supporting me uh, on some degree. But, um, you know, I, I mean, I wasn't getting 10 tournaments per year from the Federation. I was uh, being paid. Uh, if I would have won the national championship that year, I would be paid um, the world championship. Okay. And, uh, and generally the club I was playing for would pay for the European championship. Um, those were covered generally because they were quite expensive for us. Right. And uh, and then I was playing a lot of local tournaments, uh, local as in as in in Romania. Uh, but of course, you know there weren't as many. There was the Romanian uh, team championship and uh, uh, the senior uh, championship, uh, like not senior, but just the open, I guess, uh, the Romanian national championship. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of the individual coaching you got, did you get any help for that or no? No, no, okay. no. That was, uh, that was always from, uh, from my family's pocket. Okay. Yeah. So an expensive hobby. And I, I, I don't know what your personal family situation was like, but uh, Romania is not the most well-off of the European countries, right? Abs absolutely. And, and I come from a middle-class uh, family, but um, coaching is not as expensive in, uh, in, in Europe in general. Uh, especially in Romania. So uh, in the United States, it's a completely different uh, thing. Yeah, you, you, most grandmasters get paid um, in, in the proximity of $100 per hour. Uh, in, in Romania, it's far from that. <laughs> right. Far, far from that. So, um, you know, I, uh, my family supported me. And, uh, and you know, I, I never had anything to complain about. Okay, good. So you get to UTD. What was that like? How big of a culture shock was it to go from uh, Romania to Texas? <laughs> well, uh, I, the thing is, I, I'm, I'm used. It wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. I had a lot of people. I had a lot of people helping me with that uh, transition, uh, and and I just embraced it because I was traveling since I was five years of age. You know, I, I was traveling a lot. And most of the times I, w I wouldn't be with, with, my pa with my family. I would be only with friends. Um, and I was meeting a lot of international people, a lot of international friends. So um, I, I guess because I didn't have such a standardized uh, upbringing, you know, I guess I, for me it was easier to adapt to, um, to the American culture. But, you know, of course, uh, of course there were some things... Uh, like uh, burgers and right. and and, uh, and, uh, and so that that uh, I, I never got used to. So you don't and, uh, you weren't a fan of those? No, no, I was never a fan of those uh, for some reason. And then when I got to the U.S., you know, college years uh, tend to uh, kind of force you to to sometimes right. do those things <laughs> uh, under certain circumstances. So you know that 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 was not that bad. Um, having three other roommates in the, in the same flat was quite, quite an interesting experience. <laughs> Sounds um, like you're being diplomatic. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I really okay. enjoyed my roommates. I, I, I had a lot of fun with them. Nice. Um, and they were chess players too? No. Oh, no, okay. No, I'm surprised. No. Um, well, it, 
you know, the I think the team wasn't in its infancy. Uh, that's uh, uh, that's badly phrased, but it um, was. Yeah, it was in its infancy, right? It wasn't. It wasn't. No. It oh, wasn't. okay. It wasn't. No. UT Dallas has a rich history. They, okay. They are the first. Uh, I think one of the first universities that started the chess program back in maybe 1998. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but I don't know. I mean, I never asked to, to, to be paired with, uh, with, with a chess player. I know nowadays that's kind of uh, the norm. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, new freshmen uh, want to, to, to get roomed with, uh, with other chess players. Uh, but I... I never had that option, and I didn't really care about it. Okay. <laughs> so I actually wanted to, you know, make new friends outside of the chess world. So, um, okay. So, were there moments where I mean, it's you know, it's so far away from home, and you didn't know that many people. So, were there moments where you thought about like dropping out, or were you reasonably happy there? Uh, I, I was. I was always happy. I. I. I, I was quite lucky uh, that my girlfriend at the time. Um, she came one year after me. Oh wow! I, uh, we were together uh, before I left for for university, and then she got accepted to the same university. Uh, she was a chess player as well, uh, and we spent college years together. So that kind of alleviated this, uh, you know, uh, homesickness. I guess. Yeah, that makes a huge um, difference. So, so that 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 really helped. Um, but you know, of course, I'm I'm a I'm a single kid. Right. Uh, I'm a lone, uh, only only child, uh, so it's it's always tough. It's tougher for my parents to be honest. <laughs> but uh, I, I try to go at home, uh, try to go home at least twice a year, and just always keep contact with my family. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and actually, you know, we've been I've been trying to trying to get you on the show for a while, and one of the things that had slowed us down a little bit was you you recently went home, right? Mm-hmm, 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 and how was yeah, I, how was the trip? Uh, the, the trip the trip uh, is always fun to Romania. <laughs> you know, I get to see uh, a lot of my friends. I get to see my family, and um, we have some uh, wild nights. From nice, time. excellent. <laughs> yeah, with uh, with 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 my buddies. What's and, the uh, uh, drink of choice in Romania? Oh, we drink everything. Okay, uh, but. Uh, well, the specific Romanian drink is uh, palinka, which is uh, the, I think in the U.S. they call it the wine spirit. Okay. Uh, but it's extremely, extremely potent. It has like seventy degrees Celsius. Uh, I don't know Fahrenheit Celsius. I think they. Um, I don't even know what what type of degrees. You're talking about the percentage uh, of alcohol. The percentage, yes. Yeah, yes. seventeen sounds. That's a lot for. Seventy. Yeah. 17. Seventy. Oh, okay. So it's basically yeah. So it's basically it's a spirit. Stronger. It's much stronger than uh, than whiskey. Okay, man. Much stronger than whiskey. So um, it's 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 a rough one. <laughs> <laughs> you, you get a few shots of those, and uh, you're. You're on your ass. Okay. Can, can I see that? Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's it's encouraged. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. Well, yeah, that sounds like fun. I mean, that's a, that's a part of going home for sure. Uh, re, you know, get together, have some drinks, and re, relive old days. And Of course, of course. And I actually enjoy uh, going home a lot during uh, uh, during the winter time because uh, in, in California, I don't get a lot of winter time, of course. And um, I, I enjoy snowboarding. So. Oh, fun. So one of the things I'm always looking forward to whenever I go back home for Christmas and New Year's. And, okay. So in, in digging through your your blog, uh, I came across the post where you moved to the Bay Area, but you didn't like you didn't talk that much about what led you to to go from Texas to there. So I was just curious because like the world's kind of a blank slate once you're out of college and you're committed to being a chess professional. So what led you to decide to live in the Bay Area? <laughs> I just uh, I, uh, I I recently separated with my girlfriend, which was uh, quite a shock for 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 me, and uh, and I recently met this guy Arun Sharma. Okay. Who is uh, who is a chess player as well? He's an international master. He's uh, I think uh, um, one of the founders of the initial 
Pro Chess League, which yes. was called, I think, the American Chess League. US or Chess League, yeah. US Chess, US Chess League. So him and Greg Shahadi uh, came up with this idea, and uh, he's one of the founders. And uh, I just met him at, I think it was uh, during, no, it wasn't during Millionaire. It was, I think, during a Philadelphia Open. Um, and uh, I understood that he bought a house. So I asked him, can I, uh, can I rent with you? And uh, then he was like, yeah, sure. But, you know, things are not easy around here. <laughs> I, I didn't have a lot of savings. But, uh, you know, I just uh, took the leap. Uh, went, went to California and, uh, you know, started building uh, started building a uh, family over there, basically. Nice. So where, where in the Bay Area is Aaron's place? Or was in it? In El, El Cerrito. Okay. El Cerrito. Yeah, I'm still staying there. Uh, okay. He, he has an amazing house. Uh, and generally, it's just uh, me and him in like a four bedroom house. Nice. So, uh, and you've. Uh, his, hmm? Sorry, go on. Uh, I'm his long, uh, long standing uh, tenant. Excellent. <laughs> yes. yeah. And you latched yeah. on to the Bay Area Chess Organization. What other connections yes. have you made out there? Well, that's, you, you know, that's the one I'm, I'm holding, uh, ho- holding uh, dear life to because they're, you know, I. We kind of started the program, um, the team program that I'm mostly involved with. Uh, I'm not teaching any any, any classes, any schools because uh, they're actually uh, in in South Bay. I'm more in East Bay, so I have like a one hour drive whenever I go to teach for them. Right. Uh, but what we do is uh, we have these uh, teams, and I teach the elite team, which is uh, players over two thousand. Okay. Um, and, and and they have all these tiers. They they go all the way down to like pure beginners. Um, so we started that I think uh, two years ago, uh, one year after I ended up in Bay Area, and uh, yeah, it's it's been a smooth ride. I, I've enjoyed a lot working with them. They have uh, they have a, an incredible foundation and uh, and hardworking people. Nice. And you're, so you, I am Kostya Kovutsky works for them too, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, they they attracted a lot of players. Uh, they, they have, uh, Kostya, uh, they have, uh, Zviad, Izoria Zviad, who is a grandmaster, I think, uh, yeah. that, uh, was living a lot, uh, a lot of time in, in, in New York and recently moved to, to the Bay area. And, uh, Sevigliano, I think is also one of the other grandmasters working for them. Um, but yeah, they attracted a lot of people because uh, they have a lot of business, and you know they they, they can disperse it to to, to everybody. Excellent. So. Yeah, I'm I'm curious. I'd like to hear more about the sort of business origin story, but you're probably not the right person to ask. So yes, yes. So someone... Again, I'm I'm only doing teams for them, and you know I I've well we basically since the inception of this idea of teams of having the uh, you know. Uh, Teams to help grow the, the the youngsters in the Bay Area. Yeah, I mean, and it seems like they're doing an awesome job. Obviously, they've you know produced players like Shankland and Nerodsky. <laughs> Sorry, Daniel. <laughs> and, uh, well, and, uh, Dania is also working for us. Okay, uh, Dania Nerodsky. Yeah, and he's in he's at Stanford too, right? So keep it. He's keep a Stanford it, guy. Yeah, yeah, keeping yeah. busy. Um, excellent. Well, I mean, keep up the good work, and it must be fun to work with those uh, with such talented kids. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean that. You know, uh, again, I, I I get burned out quite quickly. So <laughs> if the student is not right, it's going to be very difficult for me to to get motivated. But um, if the student is is right, then I I really enjoy working well, with. Uh, yeah, I mean, and it's it's good that you recognize that about yourself, but also that like you're you're able, you're in a position where you can say no, you know, like. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it took me a while, uh, but I, I I think right now I'm. You know, I have quite a few students, and uh, most of them are handpicked. That that's good to hear. And you, you in a lead, you, you excuse me, your most recent column for the U.S. Uh, U.S. Chess Online. You said you talked about being a chess professional, and you identified as a chess player, coach, journalist, and commentator, and talked about how you had to be, you had to be willing to do a little bit of everything. So, mm-hmm. how did you sort of, uh, you know? You 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 graduated college and you knew you were going to be a chess professional. Did you know like exactly what facets you would be focusing on? I had absolutely no idea. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. I had absolutely no idea, and it took me a long time to to, to figure it out. You know, I just uh, 
uh, took, took it slow, took it one at a time. I, I had different ideas two years ago than I had right now. So um, I tried a bit of everything. And I, you know, I, I, I for example, I was uh, booked as sort of a team building uh, speaker for like, you know, startups. So uh, that was an idea at some point for, for, for myself to, to open up a business uh, uh, based on uh, based on that idea. But it, it didn't work out. I didn't really enjoy it that much. Um, you know, you, you just uh, go with the flow. I, I, I always went with the flow. I always went with my intuition. And, um, you know, it kind of worked out in the end. <laughs> And do you have, I know you did some uh, announcing for some of the St. Louis tournaments recently. How, what was that experience like? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, you know, that's great. The St. Louis is, is, is the best place uh, to work as a chess professional, in my opinion. Uh, they treat you very nicely. Um, and uh, just being around all these uh, personas or all these uh, chess superstars uh, is it, just incredible. So uh, that was a lot of fun for me. It was very motivating and uh uh, very challenging as well. So that's that's what what I always try to do. Just challenge myself in everything I do, and um, as long as it's challenging, it means you're going to grow nice. and you're going to learn new skills. So I think that's very important. So it sounds like overall, you'd say as a chess professional, things are going reasonably well for you. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. That's great. Um, it must uh, must feel good for after all those hours you put in as a kid. You know, like. All, all the tough losses. <laughs> no, of course. Uh, but I, I kind of knew that this is what I want to do. So, um, yeah, I, I, I had this this image in, in, in my head that I want to be a chess professional even when I was in college. I, I never uh, really even considered using my degree too much. Um, I wanted to have it as a backup, obviously. Uh, and part of the reason I accepted it was the, because it was also a chance for me and my girlfriend back in the days uh, to be together. So that was another reason for it. And it was just, uh, you know, the, the, the United States appeal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, which was not such a developed scene back then, three, three four years ago. Right now it's just uh, it's hectic around here. Everybody wants to come to the United States. Um, there's so many chess programs. You, you you have the St. Louis University. You have uh, you have Dallas. You have uh, Brownsville. You you have Webster, who are just the big dogs. Um, well, at least for the past five years, we'll see if they manage to continue their uh, with their good efforts. But yeah, it's just uh, an exciting. I, I think it's an exciting era for for chess in the United States. I think it's the best place to be if you want to be a chess professional. Yeah, and, and that's uh, for us Americans. That's a that's a great feeling because I'm I'm old enough to remember when it was kind of the opposite. Right, right. When when the European scene uh, was uh, was the best place to be, but right now you have guys uh, like Rex Singfield, you know, that that are just pumping funds into chess and and helping chess grow. And, um, you know, I think we're, we're on the right track. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. And I, when I was a kid, it sort of felt, it felt like not just that there wasn't as much opportunity in the U S but it felt like maybe there was like a talent gap because, Mm -hmm. because, uh, the Soviet, you know, the, the former Soviet countries, um, Mm -hmm. were just so dominant and to a lesser extent Europe and, you know, like we had Jesse Cry on a few weeks ago. He was like the first like American born grandmaster in like six years or something when he got right. the title. Like, right. and, and now that's kind of, and like, you know, I grew up with Greg Shahadi and like he, you know, didn't chase the GM title that hard, but like that would have been a thing if he had gotten it. Like it was just so rare. And now I don't, it's not, I would never say it's routine because it's such an, amazing accomplishment but it's not rare anymore of course of course of course and uh, i guess because we're living in in the age of information and it's so easy to to get it it's so easy to go on a computer install a chess base and 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 start training you know yeah and you have all the tools necessary to 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 make that leap you don't you don't you no longer need a coach a local coach that could help you you can uh hire a coach uh, on skype you know from the other side of the world and uh, you're going to be fine uh, if you need guidance but also you have so many tools you know and um 
I, I, I think that helps. You have places to play. You have uh, like chess.com. I think chess.com is a great project. And, um, you know, they're, they're doing a lot of things right. Um, they, they have a huge database of videos, you know, uh, of, of events, of, of strong players that are playing and, and, and ready to, to be challenged on the website. So, you know, you have those tools. Back in the days, I mean, you had a few Russian books uh, that you could uh, somehow, uh, somehow get your hands on. And uh, that was it. And you would study those uh, day and night, yeah. And, and and if you weren't doing that, you were at a big disadvantage uh, to to the people that were actually doing that, and the people that actually had those books, which were the Russians, yeah. Um, so yeah, the books and the network, you know, of and course, the infrastructure, of course, of course. yeah. Um, yeah, I'm glad things have turned around. Okay, so Christian, I have a couple more sort of serious questions for you, and then I want to get to the to the fun stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so, on the serious note, you mentioned already the Jakob Agard books, which are you know becoming basically every guest here uh, mentions them. I mean, they're they're a great resource. Do you have any other? What, or I should say, what other recommendations do you have for people looking to improve at chess, whether it be books or videos or just general advice? Well, one thing. Uh one thing that I tell all my students is, um, and I've heard it from a lot of people, a lot of very strong people, um, is that they always, every day, every single day, whenever they wake up, first thing they do is just go through all the games that have been played uh, during that day in the world. So you have resources such as Chess24, you have Play Chess, which is uh, my favorite, Play Chess, uh, playchess.com, you, you download um, the app not the app, the, the the platform on your on your desktop, and then you just go through that. It's kind of like a cousin of chess base, basically. So okay. the the interface is very similar. You can also, what I do is also I save the games that I see uh, that belong to my repertoire, um, or games in which I see a very nice uh, tactical pattern or like a very nice uh, uh, conversion. And those uh, those materials I generally use for my students. Uh, but I think this is extremely important. Uh, it helps you kind of keep in contact with what's happening in the chess world on a daily basis. Uh, it's not very difficult. You don't have to analyze all these games. You just have to go through them. Um, once again, see if you spot any interesting interesting opening ideas and then maybe two days later when you have more time you will go back and you will actually uh you will actually analyze that particular uh light it's just an example right but um yeah i think this is extremely important always always looking for fresh ideas and uh, the best way to do that is just to go through all all the games that have been played during that day. Every every morning when you wake up, if you have time, um, if you don't wake up earlier, <laughs> huh. uh, and, and 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 just do that. I think it's going to help uh, help a student's chess game grow exponentially. Okay, so we're talking what, like forty five minutes, or how much time to would you spend reviewing something like that? Something okay. like that. Maybe, maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half uh, at times. Um, I mean, you, you go quite fast. Through, through those games, you know. Um, and that's why I like using play chess because you can, uh, as as with chess base, you, you have, I think, uh, like a next game uh, button. So you just press on that button and then just jumps to the next game. Um, and it's the transition is very easy. The interface is, is very easy to work with. Um, so that's why I like it. Uh, chess 24 is fine as well, but... It also has it, it chess twenty four also has uh the engine well actually you can close the engine tab so um I think that helps as well to not have the engine on okay to not have to not have it yeah okay so um, that you focus more on 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 the information uh in front of you and trying to absorb that makes sense and uh do you have any any other book recommendations um from the top of my head uh i I, I cannot think of anything. But you know, there's uh, there's plenty of good books, I guess, out there. There's, uh, I think, the Zurich uh, 1973 is a pretty 53, good book. Yeah. 53, yes, um, that's a good book. Um, but yeah, I, I, I tend to to stick with uh, the Dvoretskys, uh, the Jacob Algards, you know, those type of books um, from from a theory point of view. 
Uh, I really enjoyed the, uh, what's his name? Uh, Avruch, Avruch's books. Mm-hmm. Uh, very, very good uh, from a theoretical point of view. Um, nevertheless, I think those are quite old right now. Right. Uh, he had a very good 1D4 that was covering everything after 1D4, basically. And then he had a good Grunfeld book, which is uh, one of my favorite, well, it's my favorite opening. And uh, that's how I started with it. Uh, back in maybe 2013, um, just by reading his books, uh, trans- like transposing what whatever was in the book in the in, in the uh, computer and analyzing it with an engine or stuff like that. So that helped me a lot. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, you know, there's a, there, there's a lot of resources. Again, it's it's based on it's based on style and it's based on what you're enjoying. Um, to work on most, so I think I think first you should know yourself, and first you should know what you like working on, and uh, and 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 then of course you you can uh, you can arrange your your training routine based on that. Okay, sounds like good advice. Mm-hmm. All right, so Christian, last last major topic I want to talk about at least is I caught you in a couple of the uh, chess bra vlogs over at the Olympiad. So I mm-hmm. of course wanted mm-hmm. to uh, wanted to hear any uh, any wild tears you're willing to share, or if you want to give like more of the professional perspective of what it was like to be over there um, helping some players out. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, I, I was uh, I was just uh, helping Eric Hansen during that tournament. Um, so that's what I were you guys at UTD at Paris. the same time? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, we 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 were at UTD at the same time. It was me. Uh, Alejandro was also at the same time. Um, Alejandro Ramirez, and uh, I, I yeah, I guess from from the public faces, that's kind of uh, those are the names. But uh, yeah, we 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 were uh, at least only for one year, I think, though. Uh, he came after me, and then uh, he decided to focus uh, on chess. So I think uh, he he withdrew from from college. I still had one or two years left. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I was I was just helping. You know, we 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 partied a little bit, but to be honest, the Olympiad was um, more more of a serious event. Um, Eric took it quite seriously. So, nice. Okay. Well, uh, well, I want to get into the preparation, but first, I have to ask you: like, seeing Eric at college, did you have any inclination that he was going to be like a Twitch superstar? Uh, I no, no. I, I mean, I didn't really know. Uh, we, 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 we did start talking about Twitch, and uh, he, he seemed inclined to enjoy doing that. And uh, he managed to, you know, to build a, a, a big fan base. Um, and uh, I mean, he, I remember when I was, uh, I was, uh, I was watching him, and he had maybe, you know, twenty, thirty view, view, views, views, wow. right? <laughs> right. So um, that's back in the days. And Twitch wasn't such a big thing. Uh, Twitch wasn't such a big thing from from a chess perspective either. Um, you know. Uh, but it's it's a rough world. It, Twitch is not that easy to <laughs> to go into because uh, you know you you, you get a, a lot of uh, backlash if you play bad chess. You know, so there's a there's there's always trade off. There's always a trade off. That's e- funny. I, a, hmm? go, sorry, go ahead. Eric is a very good uh, rapid player, bullet yeah. and, and and bleeds uh, especially online. So uh, that definitely helped with, uh, you know, building, uh, building this persona. You say it's a rough world, but I feel like the chess bras are like universally loved. <laughs> do, do, do you like or do they have you in your experience hanging out with them, like experience a lot of like sort of online troll type mm. people? I mean, <laughs> there is a lot of trolls online, you know, right. there's a lot of trolls online. And then uh, on, on every, you know, every stream you get some 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 bad apples that are just going to start swearing at you and uh, make fun of how bad you're playing at times, you know, and so on. So um, that can take a toll on you uh, if you if if you're not willing to accept that necessarily, right? Um, so that's that's one of one of the things that I find quite difficult about uh, about streaming, um, but also the time commitment. I mean, in order to 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 amass 
such such an audience you actually have to put a lot of time into it and uh that's uh i i think that's what eric does full time basically yeah right? yeah they obviously take it very seriously so yeah 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 yeah, yeah. it's it's a it's a full time job yeah um Okay, and um, talking about the Olympiad, so it was serious business. So we've had a few people who've done some sort of seconding and help with prep uh, for people, but I still would like to hear your experience. So, like, what was your what was your day to day like life like, other than filming some uh, chess bra vlogs when when you were over there? Right. That I mean, I film maybe let's say um, two hours of of. of of a, a film altogether, so it wasn't such a huge time um, time constraining uh, activity. Most of the days uh, we were just waking up quite early, you know, uh, getting to work at around, getting some breakfast, getting to work at around ten, and uh, and then just to, just working for two three hours, and, uh, and and go to the game, and at night just dinner, relaxing. Uh, not too much partying and just uh, taking it seriously overall. Yeah, and Canada had had a good result, and Eric played. You know, he played legends like Nigel Short and mm-hmm. some other great players. So, w- when you're helping him prepare for someone like that, like how much of it is just like Eric's repertoire versus like trying to punch some sort of hole in a game of a player who's so good that they don't have a lot of holes? Oh, it. it I think more or less it was. Hundred percent, his repertoire. You know, okay. I was just, uh, I was just trying to help uh, patching it. You know, and uh, and and when whenever I had that some some interesting ideas, I would share them with with him, and if he if he liked them, then he would use them. Um, but uh, I, I think we're quite uh, our repertoires are quite different. I, I'm playing D4 mostly, and variations of D4, Knight F3, C4, and so on. Uh, he's uh, more or less a pure one e four player, um, so and he played only whites. He he played like ten whites oh, wow. out of eleven games. Yeah, huh. so they, they they were playing him uh, as as the striker. You know, <laughs> that's as, funny. As, as the guy that was supposed to to score, they were giving him white quite often. So um, yeah, um, I, I had to adapt to it. You know, I had to adapt to it. We did a lot of E4 work. Yeah, that's maybe going to be used at times. <laughs> so not all of it unveiled yet? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> nice. Of course not. And I guess you don't get to use it if you're mostly a D4 player. So. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't really use it. But who knows? Maybe, uh, maybe I'll come back to my roots. I, I used to play E4 uh, okay. when I was a kid. Uh, well... All the way up until uh, I don't know 2012 maybe I think uh, I think I stopped playing E4 in 2012. I had this uh, moment in college when I was just really burned out on chess because my results were um, were quite bad because I had to adapt to you know the new lifestyle of of, of having to deal with academics and having to deal with responsibility uh, on that side. And uh, and also playing some chess from time to time, uh, without really having a lot of time to, to to train in between. So my results were uh, were not very good, not very encouraging, and and I kind of got burned out. And I was like, I don't know any theory in E4. Uh, I am losing a lot of games in the French, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, I'm gonna go to I'm gonna switch to D4. Um, I, I started working with. Uh, with a guy named Grivas, Grivas F. Stratios. And uh, we worked for a little bit. He, he taught me uh, some D4, and uh, I've been playing it since. And I, I think it uh, has molded well on, on, on my style. Okay. <laughs> nice. Okay, so uh, finishing up uh, the Olympiad, mm-hmm. uh, in the vlog, you, uh, you guys went to the Bermuda party, the legendary Bermuda party. Um, right, right. But uh, it seemed uh, the the scuttlebutt in the video is you made kind of an early disappearance. So, so what happened there? <laughs> uh, I did, I did make an early disappearance. The, the Romanian uh, exit. <laughs> I ghosted. I completely yeah, ghosted. Right? Yeah, that's what you said in the video. <laughs> I completely ghosted. Yeah. No. The thing is, uh, <clears throat> you know, I stayed all the way up until maybe. 
2, 2 a.m., maybe even 3 a.m., but uh, I, I think a lot of people stayed all the way up until 5, 6 a.m., so um, that's kind of the reason, but I, I you know, I just... I just got completely wasted. <laughs> yeah, no, but two to three, two to three a.m. That's a that's a respectable showing. <laughs> to, to 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 put it uh, bluntly, I just got completely wasted, and, <laughs> and then I took a cab. Uh, that's that's one thing uh, I I know when my limit is. So okay, that's good. I, I kind of know when when my night cap was, and I have to order a cab, go back home, and get some sleep. You know, so yeah. that's what happened. And I mean, generally, I'm not going to start. <laughs> saying right. goodbye to everybody. You know, <laughs> right. Place, you know? Well, but well, two to three a.m. It's not like you lost a that's, mini a miniature, right? No, you no, you made it to bad. like the early end game or late middle game. No, I, absolutely, absolutely. I don't think I missed. Uh, I, I missed a lot. You know, the party was still ongoing, but uh, I, I had a lot of fun. It was my first Bermuda party, so you have to. Uh, Cut me some slack. I didn't have experience. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's a wild party. Right. The Bermuda party is a wild party. <laughs> yeah, I, I can only imagine because I, you know, I'm I'm uh, over the hill now, both in in chess and in partying. But uh, but um, but one thing I've noticed or I remember from my youth is uh, chess players are not so good at moderation. So <laughs> oh no no no, <laughs> so no you, no, you no. give them give them a, a rare opportunity to get together and have fun and uh, yeah people people will take it too far, which makes for good entertainment value. Very very often, of course, and you know it's, um, you see people that. You look at them and you think they're super serious, you know, and they're, uh, you know, only focusing on chess in, in real life. And then you get to experience a Bermuda party with them and you change their, <laughs> your, your whole perspective. Yeah. You know? And things, but, things uh, that can't be unseen perspectives you, you can't lose. <laughs> of course. Of, nice. course, of course. Excellent. All but, right. Uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Okay. All right, just one more thing, Christian. So in one of your write-ups of the, I think it was the Millionaire Open, you and it was from a few years ago, you told a story of seeing Jeffrey Zhang when he was young and it was getting ready for the playoff and you talked about him being off to the side just playing through moves while everyone else was sort of just standing around. Uh, do you have any recollection? Right, 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 right. of course, of course. Uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was uh, in, in the last one, I think. Yeah. Uh, when when I already qualified for uh, for for the final four and he was uh, battling uh, a lot of strong players to qualify to their final four, which was the uh, the overall final four, the open final four. I qualified for the under 2551, um, and he was uh, facing um, I think uh, Mamedov, uh, Darius uh, Zvierts, and um, Cordova, Emilio Cordova, I think. And I think there was another very strong individual, uh, but I cannot mm, recollect his name. But yeah, what 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 was what struck me was uh, that he was uh, all the way in the back, and he was just playing. He it looked like he was playing with himself, like playing playing chess with himself, yeah, uh, against himself, I guess. And uh, I mean that was very strange to me, you know, because he was just secluded from everybody else. Everybody was just like walking around in between rounds, you know. It was a very tense situation because uh, it, it it was a rapid playoff, and only I think one or two spots uh, were qualifying. So uh, a lot of stake, a lot at stake. And uh, what he was doing, it was just continuing uh, playing chess, you know. That that was quite striking to me, and. Um, it, it kind of gave me a perspective of, of how serious he takes it, you know, how, how serious uh, he takes uh, chess as a profession. And um, I, I know it because I also worked a little bit with him and um, I, I know his, his routines and um, I think he has a great future ahead of him. Yeah, it'll be fun to see what, what he can do in the coming years. No, absolutely. I, I mean, um, you know, he's been slowing down a little bit recently. Um, but still, he has uh, incredible p potential. We'll, we'll see where where he takes him. But um, when he's in shape, when he's in good shape, he's very hard to stop. Yeah. In okay. certain positions, you know, he has he you know he also has a lot of uh, a lot of weaknesses that he's obviously trying to patch. Uh, but certain positions, he's just uh, at at the elite level at the moment. Twenty twenty seven, twenty seven fifty. Wow. I mean that's incredible for someone of his age. So I'm sure he'll yeah. uh, keep keep plugging away and just get better and better. 
over mm-hmm. time. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, so Christian, before I let you go, any do I, do you have any other stories that you feel like our audience needs to hear, like whether <laughs> serious or not serious? <laughs> uh, I can't. I cannot think of anything. Yeah, I mean, I'm putting you on the spot, but just in I, case, I, I cannot I think of any any. Yeah, any serious uh, or not? <laughs> not. So, I, I. I mean, there's plenty of stories, not so serious, but uh, not none, none of them, I guess, is of uh, particular importance. Okay. Um, cool. Well, uh, uh, so oh, and now uh, what's so you have this tournament coming up, and I guess you're going to make mm-hmm. your way back to the Bay Area soon. What else do you have on the horizon, like the rest of this year? Um. Well, it's going to be a busy, busy end of the year. Um. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm here as grandmaster res- in residence. Then uh, I'm going to be working uh, for the champions showdown, so that's going to be exciting. A lot of uh, strong players, an interesting format, um, an interesting time control, um, which is going to be in the middle of November. And then immediately after, I'm 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 doing uh, I'm doing this uh, this tournament. And then after the tournament Thanksgiving, I will go uh, visit my girlfriend's family. Uh, and, where where are uh, they? Uh, in Massachusetts. Okay. So first time visiting the. I have you met the family before? No. Oh wow, that's major. <laughs> that's good major. luck. Well, she she was uh, she was with me in Romania this time, and she met my family. You know, okay. I mean, you know things are getting serious, but uh, and that's going to be an interesting uh, in, interesting Thanksgiving, and uh, after that probably Bay Area, and uh, at the end of the year I'm always going. Uh, uh, back home. Okay. Wow. Pretty busy. So I'm probably not going to stay a lot in in, in the Bay Area. Okay. Cool. Well. Yeah. Well, I, as it's clear to our listeners, you're a busy guy. So I really appreciate your taking the time to join us. No, ab- absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I've I've been wanting to do to do this for a while. Cool. Um, and uh, where can people get in touch with you? I mean, we'll be watching you at the St. Louis Showdown, and we can root for you in your tournament. But if they want to contact you, what's the best way to do that? Um, well, um, there's obviously my, uh, my website, uh, Christian, uh, dash Kirilla, uh, com. And that's the best way I'm actually going to update that website. I haven't updated the website, which is a shame, uh, for a very long time. Right. Uh, but, it's uh, totally standard for a chess plan. player though. It would, I, I <laughs> it would be strange if it were updated. <laughs> I, I know I need to, I need to do that. I need to do that. I need to work a little bit on, uh, on, on, on that side of things. And, uh, on, on Twitter, if you want to, if you want to follow me on, uh, on Twitter, that's kind of, uh, the, the one social media that I'm actually taken care of, I guess, uh, not even that much, but you know, I, I, I post updates quite, quite frequently. Cool. And yeah. And chi- you chime in on a couple tournaments and stuff I've noticed. So yeah, yes. I'll, I'll link to both your website and the Twitter page and, uh, and, That's um, great. cool. That's and great. yeah, we'll be watching and rooting for you. So thanks again for coming on. Thank Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Ben. Thanks to everyone who supports Perpetual Chess. I spend about five hours a week on each episode, and even though I love doing it, it can be hard to find the time. Donations from listeners make a huge difference and make Perpetual Chess a lot more sustainable. Special shout out to my Patreon Perpetual partners. They are Johnny McMenamin, Todd Bryant, Greg Shahadi, Jen Scream, Timothy Ha, Tatia Vabramahan, Paul Sweeney, Jennifer Shahadi, Pascal Charbonneau, Zhao Cheng, Kelly Palmer, Matthew Tedesco, Gary Andrews, Krishna Galapakrishnan, Ricky Grahava, Chris Flanagan, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Rob Lazorchek, Jennifer Valens, Tim Seymour, and Chris Wainscott. Thanks a lot, everyone. I'll catch you guys next week with another episode.